Wow, what a massive audience. <laughs> Thank you. This is awesome. Um, I was talking to a friend yesterday, and uh, he kept on asking, like, okay, but your workshop and your talks, what do they have to do with .NET and C Sharp? <laughs> I tried to explain. It's, uh, they're not. He came up, yeah, but what do they have to do with C Sharp? I said, no, so this is not really a C++ conference, so um, uh, apologies, if you wish. Uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, an idea that I had in 2012, and something that happened since. Uh, so I presented the idea, and um, the funniest thing happened. Uh, years later, I looked on my Wikipedia page. Yes, I have a Wiki, Wikipedia page, <laughs> friends. So I was looking at my Wikipedia page, which I never do anything with. I never participate in it. I just let people go. So essentially, there's a guy who deleted everything I've done from Wikipedia. <clears throat> and there's one thing left, which was Andre invented the expected type. That's the only thing on Wikipedia probably right now that I did. And um, so I thought, ah, I should give a talk about it, because it, it seems to be a v the last bastion of things that I've done that are, are interesting to people. So um, what happened was, uh, after I presented this, uh, this idea in, uh, uh, in 2012, uh, one uh, fine gentleman, Jean-Francois Bastien, he took it and ran with it. Uh, he was very nice to give me credit too, but essentially he took, he did all the legwork, which is real, like 95% of the work, to standardize it. So as of right now, what we're talking about is being proposed for standardization for C++20. Um, so you know, this talk might have, um, might be um, more applicable in the near future than uh, than it may seem. Okay. So we're going to start with uh, discussing exceptions. Who's a fan? Yes, who like ex Okay, who's coding C++? Starting with a couple of us don't. Okay, who, so who, who hates exception? Exceptions, exceptions suck, man. The same people, right? Okay, so <laughs> left hand votes that way, right hand votes the other way. Awesome. So. Um, most of us, you know, when I read about exceptions, well, quite literally, my, my next like, you know, 5,000 lines of code, they all had a try catch in there. There's all the functions I wrote. Oh my God, so awesome! And try and catch, and they become blue in the editor. And I was so jazzed about it. Oh my God, it's a keyword. So I get to do try and catch and catch things and throw things, and that was awesome. But I took them for, uh, for the most part, uh, all of this exception business for me. It was well, this is the feature, you got to use it going forward. And it was very unclear to me what would be uh, the motivation of exceptions and how did they came about. I mean, how come it's all about this throw and catch and stack unwinding and all of this nonsense, right? So what we're going to do right now is we're going to start from a <clears throat> universe without exceptions. And we're going to slowly figure out what it takes to um, handle errors non-locally, if you wish. And we're going to get to a model of exceptions that is pretty much the, the proposed model, the existing model. So first of all, like, oh, I pressed the, ah, aha, OK, great. I have this new remote which does this. How about that? <laughs> all right, so um, what would be a proper, uh, proper baseline? So what do you compare uh, exceptions, exceptions against as an error handling mechanism? Right? What are the design goals? What are the use cases? How do their semantics support these use cases, etc.? Et so I'm sure uh, most of us uh, in this room do have um, a notion, or you know, do have some some uh, some perceptions, some uh, some ideas about uh, about answering these questions. So um, let's move on to uh, considering. The exceptions, um, sort of, you know, the base, the core definition of an exception, it would be an exceptional case. The problem with this definition is, what's exceptional really depends a lot on the context. It's by, you know, exceptional is by definition subjective, because what's exceptional is not normal. What is normal? The norm. What is the norm? Something that you encounter all day long, right? 
it's sort of the average, it's the, the, you know, the, the run of the mill situation. So I've been working on systems in which uh, things that would be considered normally ex exceptional were not. Uh, I've been working on systems such as machines interconnected via, via a very, very solid interconnect. And uh, if there's, the two machines are not communicating, uh, that would be uh, as bad as the RAM not working. So in that case, opening a file or communicating with opening a socket to the other machine would have been an exceptional case. Um, similarly, something that would be considered um, kind of a normal, uh, normal thing um, otherwise would be exceptional in these other systems, etc. So depending on the situation, you may consider exceptional things. Uh, different. Uh, by the way, you know, Alan, uh, I keep pressing the room. So, you know, Alan Perlis, he, he's uh, sort of the father of, uh, of computing funny uh, one liners. And he said famously that one man's constant is another man's variable. So, uh, what do we want from an exception uh, system uh, that error handling in general that is, uh, that is palatable? We want to learn it once and use many times. So, we don't want to have many mechanisms. Uh, sadly, I'll open a parenthesis right here. Sadly, uh, in C++ we have quite a few ways of handling errors and more are coming by. Which is a sign to me that uh, people are not really super happy with what's going on right now. Who knows about Herb Sato's latest proposal? Alright, so I'm in the right crowd here. So I'm seeing a, a, pa a patch there of people who are like, yeah, yeah, we know what's going on. So, um, <clears throat> we want to minimize soft errors and maximize the hard errors. And what's a software, what's a hardware, who can, there's a, I'm taking this term from reliability, um, from, from re reliability theory, if you wish. What would be a software? A software is not discovered immediately. A hardware is discovered, as soon as it happens, you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a detection. So, what would be an example of a software in C++? Dynamic pointer. Thank you, dangling pointer, you said it yesterday too. So a dangling pointer would be a great example because it just sits there and the program may even continue running almost correctly until it doesn't, right? And you know, all the demo, uh, nasal demons and stuff. Those of you who've been yesterday in, um, in the um, uh, C++ meetup um, organized by, by Pat here. So, you, you know, uh, Adi gave a great, uh, a great talk and part of it was uh, a function that was never called that would remove everything from your drive. And even though it was ostensibly never called, it was called. <laughs> and it, was, uh, it would remove everything from your drive. <clears throat> Simply because the, the C++ um, a model of computation uh, considers all behavior defined and by the, uh, you know, considers that the, the behavior of any given program is defined and does optimizations uh, uh, based on that assumption. And uh, then whenever you have undefined behavior, it's going to, um, you know, really odd things are going to happen. Now, uh, we want to uh, minimize these softwares. We want to have as few softwares as possible. That, you know, it's a bad, the software is a bad thing in a, in a reliable system. We want to maximize the hardware so you detect them as soon as they happen. Um, another thing that we want would be to uh, allow centralized but also local handling. Right? And I'm sure you, you can figure that some systems for handling errors are good at local handling immediately right there. You test an error code real quick. Right? And the others would be, um, you know, better centralized error handling, which is I throw from everywhere and I catch in one place. Right? By the way, uh, by show of hands, uh, how many of you think, uh, what is, okay, no, how do I phrase this? What is the ideal ratio of throws to catches? Um, one to one. Or less. Okay. Zero, to zero. zero to zero. Zero to zero is correct, <laughs> no matter what. Okay, uh, 10 to one. 10 throws for each one catch. All right. Uh, 100 to one. Uh, 1,000 to one or more. All right, thank you. So we have a few opinions. I think, um, I, I have no idea, but I think that <laughs> yeah, there's no answer to this. Uh, but I do, I do think, and a lot of people agree, that uh, you need to have in a good application uh, a bunch of throws, but only a handful of catches, because exceptions are designed specifically for handling errors uh, in, in a centralized fashion, as opposed to in a local, in a local manner. 
right? Uh, but we want both because sometimes you, you want that, sometimes you want the other, so you want a flexible system. And uh, that's what we're going to aim for this, uh, this talk. Um, we want to be able to transport an arbitrary, uh, I keep on, uh, we want to transport this arbitrary amount of their information from the, from the throw side to the cache, so from whenever the error happened to wherever the error is going to be detected and handled. So um, that's an interesting thing we, we would like to have. And we want to have a little cost on the normal path, which we're going to discuss a bit today. And of course, we want to make correct code easy to write, incorrect code difficult to write. Do I, I think we're in agreement about this list of uh, the I have a dream, right? <coughs> Great. Um, exhibit number A, your honor, members of the jury, I'll, I'll show the A2I function. Which is, I mean, you know, let's, gi let, let's give it credit. It's like probably the first function in the C programming language ever invented, right? So it, it, it's, a, it's an epitome of, uh, of poor error handling. Uh, the problem with A2I is in case of error, in case anything bad happens during parsing the string, it will return zero. Thank you. Which just so happens to be the most frequent valid number. Right? So then, if A2I returns, you call A2I, you get zero. So then you need to kind of figure out was it a real zero string or not. The problem being uh, the actual string zero, but also the actual string with white space preceding zero, also the string that has white space followed by a plus or minus sign, followed by 55 zeros, if I wish, followed by another million spaces because I can. That's also a valid zero. So it turns out that the parsing, the deciding whether A to I was right, you know, encountered an error or not is almost as difficult as implementing A to I itself. I'm not gonna renounce this joke, <laughs> no matter how much you don't laugh, okay? I'm not gonna, so, Another problem with A2I, which is also uh, very interesting, is that A2I is uh, what's called in math a surjective function. And I uh, summon V to come back from the drunkenness of your college years and tell me what a surjective function is. What is it? OK, you're really drunk, everybody. I, I, I he fainted. He was, he was like, oh, I was just actually, yes. It can have many different inputs and a single output. No. F minus. <laughs> okay, any? Uh, yes, please. The range equals the domain, meaning whatever. The, whatever code domain the function has, you know, the possible value, values of the output, they're going to be covered. There's going to be at least one value in the input that's going to uh, cover t uh, the, the output, right? Which means you can't reserve a particular value of an int to say, well, this particular int is a pariah, so I'm going to uh, say whenever there's an error, I'm going to return a pariah. That does happen with floating point numbers because we have NAN, thank you very much. That can happen with pointers because we have no. null. That could happen with strings. Can it happen with strings? Is there a string that's a pariah? No, an empty string would be a valid, valid string. But I know a string that never, ever, nobody ever, ever has written, which And that would be your pariah string that you return in case of error. Don't do that. That's, I was kidding. OK. So um, A to I being a subjection can't reserve a value and say, you know, whatever. So you know, I, now, just as a, as a side remark, there is an integer which is a semi-pariah. What, what is your least favorite integer? I mean int, not integer, int, in the, you know, like 32-bit int. What is your least favorite 32-bit int? Minus 1. Minus 1 is very nice. Min int. Why would we? Because you cannot take the absolute of it. 
you can't take, you can't minus it and get something positive. A bunch of code assumes that if you if x less than zero, x gets minus x, and they're like, yes, x is positive now, except when it's the minimum integer, the you know the the most negative integer. So that's a problem. Which uh, when you write library code, it's really unpleasant because you gotta pay attention to this kind of nonsense, right? So anyway. Uh, HY would be a good example of a function that um, you know has a number of issues uh, related to error handling. And I got to add the following. <clears throat> In HY, there's two kinds of errors that may happen. You may try to convert a string that's not a number, but you may also try to convert a string that is too large a number. And these are different errors. You know, you may have a, a string of digits that don't fit in an integer, and many early implementation of HY forgot about that, so they simply like, they just go through the, the input and uh, overflow the integer, and they just return some nonsense, right? All right, so let's discuss a bit about Erno. Likes Erno, love the Erno, right? So, yeah, I'm seeing like uh, some sneakers in the room. So uh, error is general, but uh, it doesn't minimize softwares because pretty much nobody's looking at it ever. Um, it allows for centralized handling. You can do a bunch of stuff and then look at Erno. Uh, it allows for local handling. You do one thing and look at Erno. Uh, you can execute an ar arbitrary. You cannot. Sorry, you cannot uh, transport an arbitrary amount of uh, error information from wherever it happens to wherever wherever uh, you are, and that's a bummer because uh, you know there's a kind of a crowding of error codes. In operating systems, they keep on trying to allocate new uh, new error codes and new kind of schemata for like divide. You know, saying well, if this bit is whatever, this happened. So uh, it's very unpleasant when you are a user and you want to add your own error codes, uh, and they get printed as uh, I don't know file error or whatever I/O error. So it's a bummer. Um, I don't think I need to insist that Erno would not be the best, would not be the flagship that we work on from now on. Right? Agreed. Thank you very much. All right, there will be a special value solution, which we discussed already. Uh, problem, you know, the main problem is it's not general enough to be considerable, uh, considered. Uh, there, are simply no, there are simply types with no, uh, no unique, uh, sorry, no singleton values, no um, um, singular, I meant to say, values. So pointers are good because there's null, and there's also like pointer minus one. Did you know the one, the pointer minus one? Oh, if you do memory mapped uh, I/O in Linux, uh, there's, there are a number of functions that return you the pointer minus one, and you actually need to check <laughs> because it's a it's a different error than if it returns null. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. This is for real. <laughs> yeah, not a joke. Don't don't. Okay, <laughs> so I make jokes. People say like, eh, whatever, <laughs> and then, okay, so. Um, with the special value, it's, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows the, the trade-offs involved and everything. So, you know, I can't transport whatever information I need. And uh, it's kind of a bummer. It looks ad hoc, and it's not a general solution, right? <clears throat> uh, we would have a solution that requires us to pass in the, uh, you know, the, uh, I want to pass in a sort of a pointer to the error information, and uh, the system fills it. This is very common in... Uh, uh, in places like Windows API, right? Uh, in Windows, uh, you very often, whenever you want to receive an error code, you kind of pass a pointer to a, a, an integer or whatever, and it fills it for you with their code if uh, if you ask for it. Um, also, like the the C uh, standard library has the st uh, string to long function, which uh, takes a string, but also takes this uh, fine gentleman here. Uh, do you know what it does? By the way, C is like, a, the, you know, it, it should be in the Guinness Book of Records because it has the most functions for converting inti uh, strings to integers in the world. It has A2I, A2L, A2UL, you know, A2 whatever, which are all bad, right? And then it has um, uh, a str string to long, string to unsigned long, string to whatever. Uh, and then it has uh, a scanf, and f scanf. And then it has, I'm not sure if, uh, even if there are, or, are around or wherever standard ECVT does this. Ring a bell? Okay, we are old, my friend. You and I are old, so what are you going to do? Okay, um, this fine uh, parameter here, E, 
um, is passed in by the user and filled by, uh, by the, the function itself with a pointer to recall. This is a double pointer. I, I'm allowed to do double pointers. This is a C++ talk, not a C sharp talk. For those of you who are in the wrong place here. Um, so you pass in a pointer to a pointer to character and the, the function fills it with wherever the conversion stopped. And then it leaves it to you to divine whatever the hell happened. Right? That kind of stuff. It's like, whoa, so where am I here? Right? So usually you want to be on the zero character, which would be the, the last, you know, past the end of the string, meaning the whole string has been converted. Uh, R would be the, the, the radix. And by the way, the radix can be as big as uh, 32. Because it, yeah, because it is like the lowercase and uppercase letters. Okay. Great. So I'm happy to teach a uh, string too long from 45 years ago and, and four months. So how about the exceptions? Um, given that we have our list to begin with, let us, uh, again, this is a universe without exceptions. So we're free to invent syntax and stylize things a bit, just for the time being. Right? So um, let's talk about uh, some like, well, I have uh, some invalid, invalid input class, which uh, contains whatever information I want to pass about uh, this function failing. And then I have something like, uh, well, how about I return an int or an invalid input? So this or here would, would signify a sort of a some type of variant, right? Who knows what variants and sometimes all? A few of us. So, well, sometimes it's like it's either this guy or the other guy. And, the, you know, the, the name of the, the, the some type would be um, it, the name is earned uh, by virtue of the type being able to encode everything that an int has plus everything that an invalid input or whatever the other guy is. Right? So it's the sum of the possible states. So that's a variant, right? So um, in our, um, you know, in our fledgling system of handling errors, we're going to have to return either an int or some other thing that happened that, you know, that prevented me from producing that int. And uh, all is good and dandy. And then I'm going to do some sort of a type switch. Notice how I made it blue because it would be a sort of a pseudo keyword. And then I pattern match on, against the sum type. And I say, well, was it the first uh, branch or the second branch? And if it's the right branch, then I'm going to, that's the happy case, and otherwise it's the, you know, it's the unhappy case. So, you know, you can read all about it, uh, algebraic types and, uh, you know, and uh, STD variant and boost variant and all that uh, good stuff. Now, of course, this is kind of uh, hopelessly local and it's kind of weird. And one thing that I don't like is that we, you know, the, the previous syntax here, I turn back a bit. So the previous syntax here gives almost equal importance to the int and to the invalid input. When didn't we agree that we have some sort of a happy case int, rare, exceptional, unhappy case invalid input? So they should be distinguished more than just uh, they are equally possible in a variant. So this, stuff, this some types technology is not really what we're, we're looking for. What we're looking for is some sort of unexpected versus unexpected milieu, vocabulary, right? Like I expect an int, but if, you know, come hell or high water, something else might be returned, right? So they need to be distinguished syntactically and semantically as expected versus unexpected values. And here, here's a, at, at this point, 36 minutes, you know, so at this very point, this talk becomes interesting. I, I, this is like a long bet, right? I'm, I'm trying, folks. I'm trying. So, you know, because until now, all, all we've done was to set up the stage to kind of say, ah, you know, what's, uh, uh, you know, what would happen if, and that kind of, you know. So, from now on, we're starting to get into something new and not, that doesn't exist anymore uh, yet. That we're just not as much inventing as discovering. The interesting uh, distinction here is that we're not being smart. We're just uh, starting with our list of the nice things we want, and then we pull on that string, and by means of uh, simple reasoning, we get to some artifact. 
as opposed to, ah, oh, we're so clever, we're gonna do something really smart that nobody, you know, nobody expects and this is awesome. So we discover more than we uh, invent something, right? It's a consequence more than, more than something uh, surprising. So, <clears throat> Um, local code should be able to work uh, whilst ignoring invalid input because that would be centralized error handling. So I should assume the happy case and just code my way out. And then uh, if anything bad happens, there should be a mechanism to, uh, to take care of that. So part, uh, by consequence, a function has an over return types plus one or more cover return, return types. And when I say one or more, it means because that particular function may call other functions that in turn choose to have their own covert return types. And the next uh, natural question would be, where do all of these hidden covert return values go? What's their deal? Well, it turns out they need to have their own, their own flow of control because they can't be handled by the happy case because the happy case is not prepared to handle them. Right, it's simple deduction, right? It's, I'm, I, nothing up my sleeves, friends. I'm really not David Copperfield here, right? I'm not inventing anything. So cover values must return somewhere, you know, somewhere to some, uh, some caller that is able to handle those uh, particular exceptional cases. And only certain callers understand certain errors, some don't, and so there's, there's a sort of a search process, if you wish, uh, for a caller that knows how to handle the, my particular exceptional case. So that means covert, return types come with covert execution paths, each with potentially its own. And the callers must plan somehow return points collecting such types. So here we are, we just invented exceptions, friends. They are a consequence as much as a terrible invention. I'm, I'm using the silence for an effect here to <laughs> let it sink in. Okay, so we get to a type-based first mass e exception handling. Let me add one little detail. Uh, first match is an interesting decision for C++ and for all object-oriented languages because all our object-oriented languages always go for best match. Who can give us an example of best match in object-oriented languages? When does the language choose the best match for you? Overloading, best match, thank you. But that would be more like C++ because some object-oriented languages are not very strong at overloading. So even more, yeah, overriding. So it's going to always pick the, you know, when a column method is going to find the most derived version of the method, yes, thank you very much, the most specialized as they say. Uh, other uh, ideas from the C++ world? Come on, templates, right? In templates, you always choose the best match. The, the compiler has this whole, this whole partial ordering business, and it's always going, whenever there's uh, some templates kind of hanging out, you know, uh, having a smoke and a beer and whatever, it's gonna say, hey, you're the best match. You go to the military, right? That's, so that's the thing. It's only the best match. However, exception, and by the way, that's not good or bad. Uh, it's just there. It's an object-oriented thing. In function languages, it's the exact opposite. And if you, have, if you talk to a functional guy, they're going to hate you because they're going to say, first match is the best match. And you say, well, I have the power of language with me. Best match is the best match. <laughs> and it just works, right? Come on, it's in the name. Best match is the best match. No, and they say the first match is the best match because in all function languages, you're going to see that the first uh, function matched is going to be called. So it matters in which order to define your, your functions. Interesting. So why is it uh, first match in exception handling? Any ideas? Uh, speed. Uh, I think it has to do with the fact that you, you, uh, you, you move up the stack and essentially the first person able to, ha to handle uh, that or anything like it is going to be a good match for, for the exception, right? Awesome. So, <clears throat> exceptions, aftermath. So they're fairly general. It's unclear whether the minimize softwares, people keep, keep on making these, uh, you know, having these memory leaks whenever exceptions are thrown. Uh, but, you know, we as a, as a community, community are getting a lot better at it. Uh, they're designed for centralized handling. 
they are not good at all at local handling. And that's a problem, friends, right? So this is pretty much the only red, definitely red line, uh, you know, red bullet point on our slide here. <coughs> they allow transporting any amount of their information. Um, they have a little cost on the normal path. Famous last words. What is the cost of exceptions when they're not thrown? Zero? Zero? More than zero? What is it? Give me a number. Uh, recently heard 40 kilobytes just for having exceptions there. 40 kilobytes. Just blowing up your binary. Right, so but that just for one exception or one catch site? Doesn't matter. Okay. All right, so 40 kilobytes may be still important in some applications. Uh, but I'm talking about runtime cost in, a, in terms of time. Do exceptions make your code smaller, uh, so slower even if never thrown? This is the question. Yes. No. Other thoughts? Yes. Thank you. So the answer was uh, the compiler must uh, generate code in a different manner when exceptions are, when the spectrum of exceptions is present, because it needs to generate prolog and epilog standardized for each function. And it also needs to make sure that whenever exception is thrown, the appropriate cleanup code is executed. Right? And that major limits the optimizations that the compiler can do, which is uh, an essential one is code motion. The compilers in non-exceptional code, let's say C, straight line code, they're going to be able to do code motion, which means you know, move fragments of code around for maximum performance. And whenever you have exceptions, this is not possible anymore because there's, uh, you know, there's restrictions on where the code can be moved. Right? Um, if you look at uh, the generated code in any function, you're going to see that actually uh, placing no except uh, to the function and all the function it calls may have a dramatic impact on the generated code. Dramatic. And no except is, not, you know, is, is, is no basket of fruit either. <laughs> because if you do put no except and you throw, you can still do that. And that is... Uh, undefined behavior. Thank you very much. And that removes all of your files on your drive, as Adi showed us last night. So, not perfect. So it's unclear whether exceptions make correct code easy to write. I would say that it took us uh, literally 20 years as a community to even, uh, so even to ask ourselves the right questions. Uh, but I think there's a lot of progress. Uh, Herb has done a lot of good work on uh, sort of proselytizing uh, proper, um, he has these exceptional C++ books and he has a lot of uh, blog posts that followed on how to write correct code in the presence of exceptions. And one of uh, the things he recommends and which is pretty awesome is you don't want to have like raw pointers in your code, raw data and whatnot in your uh, class definitions. You want to have like, you know, shared pointers or unique pointers or whatnot that take care of their own destruction. And then whenever the destructor of the class runs, it's going to appropriately destroy all of the components. So that's nice because it makes, uh, it makes exceptions, take care of uh, exception situations a lot, uh, a lot better. So today we're going to focus on the remaining red line. So this is a, uh, you know, this is my point here. Local handling will be our focus going forward. So, um, the issues we have with exceptions regard, uh, regarding local error handling is that uh, error handling when done local is very asymmetric. It's very heavy on the syntax side. It's very difficult to look at and difficult to maintain. So let's um, take a look at something of interest. We're going to implement a scheme that allows local handling with exceptions. But allow me to start with a couple of background items. We've discussed a bit of this already. STD variant or boost variant are sometimes, and they give equal importance to all members, which we don't like. Optional is an interesting uh, artifact. Knows about std optional? 
boost optional, it's either something or nothing. So it has the, that Boolean that tells you that you know it's nothing. Uh, in database terminology, that would be nullable data, right? So a column can be like a whatever floating point number or null, which means there's no value present at all, right? But you know, optional is not good because we want we don't want optional. We want not a value or nothing. We want a value or the exception that prevented that value from being produced, right? You see where I'm going with this? So I'm going with these technologies are very close to being needed, but are not really exactly what we want. Even the sort of the, the monadic world with maybe an either which mimic, uh, which are mimicked by, if you wish, uh, std variant and std optional, uh, they would not be exactly appropriate for us. So we need to do our own. Um, by the way, another related technology would be promise and future in C++. No bottom. They come from the you know multi-threading world, and uh, essentially it's uh, it's uh, again it's painfully close to what we need because it's uh, it's either you know a promise of t is either a t or it gives you the exception that prevents the t from being returned. Uh, here, however, we want eager and synchronous handling of these uh, cases. So let's um, define a simple class. Either actually that would be expected. So uh, this is kind of historical a bit, and we would have either um, a T or a new placed in a union, and we have a bool that tells me whether it's a T or not. So that would be my union type. And now we define expected, which takes two template arguments. The first is the type that is the happy case, and the second is the exception that may be produced if the happy case didn't happen, right? So we want to express the union of an over type and a cover type, so it's almost like a variant, but it gives asymmetric importance to the two branches, right? So in the normal case, the value of uh, E is, uh, a value of type T is there, in the, in the bad case, a value of type E is there, and E has extra information about what, what happened. And E would be constructed by the function that returns it, and read by the receiver of the uh, function. So an expected TE would be either a T or my dog ate my homework. Yes, it's either the homework or the dog. <laughs> right. Sorry? Or the excuse, thank you. Yes, so it's either, uh, you know, so that would be typically returned from functions. Notice that nothing has been thrown. We're not talking about throwing anything yet. Please, hands off the triggers, OK? We're not throwing anything. We are returning only. And we're returning these, <coughs> they're, you know, they're slightly larger and more uh, in elaborate values than we otherwise would be returning. But the benefit is that we get to pass around information that completely describes the computation. Either a T has, uh, has been computed, or there was some reason for not being able to compute it, and there's no T, but there's, a, there's an E. There's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a, uh, an excuse, if you wish. Uh, e, excuse, awesome. So um, now, uh, redesigning A to Y, if you wish, uh, we're going to write something like expected of int and some error type ERR, and that's my A to Y. And if you want local, you're going to look um, the result has value or result error, whatever. And the typical idiom is if result, use star result. The way this works is uh, the expected type we're going to see in a minute. The expected type is going to define primitives for testing with if. And you know, as the cool way of, the, uh, uh, you know, the C++ 1x way of you don't implement operator bool, right? What is the C++ awesome way of implementing I want to be testable with if? Explicit, Explicit thank you very much. So I, I have the illusion that everybody knows, and you're like, you know what, we're not going to say anything. Let him, let him sweat under the collar there. I you know, don't care. So yes, you implement explicit operator bool, and that makes it if testable, but not convertible to bool implicitly, which has all of the liabilities that we know about. So if result use, and then we have the star result. Star result would be dereference the result expecting an, a T. 
expecting the happy case. Okay? <clears throat> um, soapbox. I disagree with this design decision. I'm teaching it because it was taken by, by the folks in the committee who proposed this and who look at this. Um, and the reason for which this decision was taken, yeah, notice, okay, so I'm, we're talking about like if and star for something that's not a pointer. It's not a pointer, it's, a, it's there. So the fact that you use star against a non-pointer is rather new. But it's not the new worst. Because there is a type that does that, which is STD optional. And STD optional, a poor design, which uses like, oh, star means you know, the option is going to be dereferenced, even if it's not a pointer. And then the, the, you know, the folks came with the expected proposal, and they said, oh, wait a second. We have something that uses stars in optional, so we should be consistent with the poor decision, design decision we made before, so let's do that. By the way, the proposal is still in flux, so you have the power to influence it. Write your local politician, yes. Sorry? Yes, I would have an implicit conversion, so the code is unmodified, would be unmodified uh, for the happy case. So now the happy, happy case, you need, to, you need to put stars and arrows every, everywhere, so that's the problem. So, okay, <clears throat> um, if you want centralized error handling, you simply use star result with, you know, this was my personal opinion, you may love it. Uh, use star result and uh, that would be an int or otherwise it's going to throw the error. So all you need to do to your code, again, is add those stars and arrows to your code to make sure that uh, the, the, um, uh, your happy case is handled properly, right? So with expected of the uh, T and E, we're going to have an association between errors and computational goals. So that's very nice, uh, it, and it's new. Um, traditional exceptions um, are tied to functions. You say, well, you know, I have this function that tries to do something and may throw an exception. And I have this other function that may uh, do, try to do something else and it throws another exception. Uh, but here, this, the grouping is different. It's orthogonal, if you wish. In this case, we don't associate exceptions with functions, but we associate exceptions with results. Right? So function is going to return an expected, and then um, you know, the, expected, the expected itself has meaning, regardless of the function that produced it. It's going to be, uh, I'm going to transport this information around. So um, I find that very interesting, because it's pretty much like uh, with mutexes and locks. Uh, people sometimes associate mutexes and locks with function, which is the wrong way to look at it, because you want to associate mutexes and locks with data that they protect. Yes? I hope everybody is uh, thundering yes here. I know the stadium is huge and there's so many people here that maybe they're not everybody hears me, but yes, right? Yes, mutexes go with the data they protect, that's the association. It's not with like, uncle, if this function is going to use this mutex and this other function is going to use, oh my god, this other mutex, no, please. Right? It's the data. Similarly, expected would, uh, would associate uh, the error with the data that was supposed to be there. Right? <clears throat> and I like that. Uh, prob this is like my most significant bit I like about, uh, about this idea. Awesome. So now we have uh, a, a lot of advantages for the small price. So um, another thing is like naturally we have multiple exceptions uh, active. You know in C++ there's this rule, you can only have one exception in flight? Except when you can. You know in C++ you can't have multiple exceptions in flight, right? You just can't throw an exception when one is already thrown. But you can't throw from a catch and catch it inside the catch. And you have two exceptions flying, right? So, um, with... Uh, with this, you can, you can have an array of expected. You can have uh, a, you know, a map, whatever, a collection of expected objects, and some or all of them may be exceptions. No problem. So you get to collect a bunch of exceptions if you want. I wouldn't recommend it necessarily, but I, you can. So for each value that's, being, that's supposed to be somewhere, you may also have the exception that uh, prevented it from being produced. 
So that's pretty awesome. Um, you can switch at will between the style of I want to handle the error right now and I want to simply use the value for the happy case and um, if anything goes wrong, an exception is going to be thrown. So you can very naturally switch between these two programming styles. Um, teleportation, if you wish, is possible across thread boundaries, across no throw subsystem boundaries. You can even like pass it through a C API for a while as a pointer and then back from the C API into, into yours, which is like unheard of with exceptions. It's really difficult. Um, you can uh, uh, teleport across time, save the exception now, throw it later if you wish, etc. So exceptions become commoditized. Thanks for the photo. All right. Great. Commoditized. So exceptions become as OK as any other value to mess with. Right, so you can collect and group and combine them any way you want, you wish. Awesome. So let's look at an implementation. <coughs> well, it's we're not stay here. <laughs> Don't leave. So let's look at an implementation. We have a bit of uh, code here. So we have the expected class as uh, promised. We it has two parameters and it has a simple payload. It has a TEA or a ENA. And it has an OK, which is initialized to true because I'm an optimistic person. So by default, I assume that the object is good, is nice, right? So then the constructor, the default constructor of expected is going to create a T at address EA. And this guy, because it's true, is just going to work, right? I don't need to initialize it again. Make sense? So I'm initializing the T part, and OK is going to be true. Uh, by the way, there was debate about this. What is unexpected if constructed uh, implicitly from nothing? Should, it, should we go for the glass half full or for the glass half empty? And the obvious answer is, they call it expected. What do you expect? <laughs> right? So I'm not sure why any, people, any person would kind of even create that argument. So. Uh, then we have the, the, you know, the usual suspects, which would be I'm going to create an expected from a T, and I'm copying it into. And by the way, so uh, you know, those of you who already uh, use uh, C++, um, sort of more recent version of C++, you know that for each of these functions, there's a hecatom of, uh, of additional overloads that you need to add. For example, for this particular expected of const T, ampersand RHS, you need to have what other functions? Just for completeness, you are dedicated smart engineers. Yes. No, no, no. I mean, for this constructor that takes a const t reference, I would need to have other very similar constructors that. Yes, that take the r value. Thank you. That take the r value reference to team, right? And I need to have the methods that work on temporary sometimes. I don't think that constructor is actually defined for constructing our value, so probably not. But anyhow, uh, this is, a, this is um, um, what was the word? Um, a distilled down version of what you're going to find online in the implementation. Because the implementation is really like, you can, uh, there's a lot of um, repetition in, uh, in the actual implementation just to handle all the cases. The advantage being, uh, you have a lot of generality because you get initials from any R value, L value, what, what is there uh, of type T. And now we get to this uh, third overload, which is interesting. I have a constructor that takes a expected of const unexpected of E, RHS, and it initializes OK to false, and it generates an E, it constructs an E at uh, the address of nay. Now, my question to you is why do you think it was necessary to take unexpected of E? instead of E. Uh, let me kind of, uh, let me specify. Unexpected is like a completely boring wrapper type. It does, doesn't do anything at all. All it has, it has a value member, which is the actual E object that's in there. Yes, please. Excellent, thank you. T could be E. And that's actually, it can happen. What if I want to parse an integer and the error code is also an integer? Right? Uh, but wait, it gets worse. What if I want to parse an integer and the error code is a long? And then I have all the conversion nonsense going on for me, right? What if I expect an exception? 
What if I expect, ah, actually, what if I expect an unexpected? You can't do that. So unexpected is specifically designed to be a pariah in the normal values world. I'm not kidding. This, I'm not kidding. This is not a joke. Don't laugh, please, ladies and gentlemen. So unexpected was particularly designed to be distinguished, a distinguished type that you're not supposed to ever expect. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> okay. And therefore, so actually there's a limitation in the proposal. It says you, you, can't, you, you can't define expected of anything except unexpected. You can't expect the unexpected. <laughs> so that movie with that name doesn't work, okay? So very interesting, right? So this unexpected is a wrapper that simply is a tag type that you know, gives a tag on top of E to make sure E is distinguished from, from T. Nice. Um, now we have, uh, this is again a sort of a one of those usual suspects. So we have uh, expected of some type that um, may or may not be T and is going to be forwarded. Right? And um, uh, let's see. Yeah, these are interesting. <coughs> so it's, it's going to get interesting at swap. Uh, so these functions are going to uh, copy unexpected into another, so it's going to simply initialize and they're going to appropriately uh, new this or new that depending on the flag. Uh, similarly, there's a move operator, right? So we're going to move from here and there's a still move, still move. And just because I'm a bad person, I wrote OK, RHS OK. I didn't say RHS equals move or RHS OK because I know it's a Boolean, so move doesn't do anything. But believe me, there are folks right now in this room who believe he shouldn't read an STD move. That guy is not a good guy. He's not uniform. Bad person. So um, uh, as I promised, uh, it comes to the operators that uh, convert to a T. And that would be the D reference. And again, although it's not a pointer, um, it's going to uh, work this way. So um, the, uh, the star operator is going to be, if not OK, going to throw as promised. And otherwise, you just simply return a value. And then we have the um, uh, const and the uh, R value uh, reciprocals that uh, are implemented similarly. Then I get to access the error object. And notice that error here is not an unexpected of E, it's just the E. So it's, uh, it's undressed from the wrapper. The wrapper was necessary during construction only. All right, uh, do I have a value? So these are sort of the usual suspects. Operator bool, as we discussed, uh, value, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are uh, not very difficult to implement. Uh, there's a very, imp uh, very interesting practical um, primitive which is value or, what do you think it does? Value underscore or, yes, Adi? Yeah, it's, it's exactly, so if, if the, unexpe the expected thing is not there, give me that you, give me that value, you know, it's, an, it's the default value, so don't throw please, just give me that value, right? Very nice, so actually this turns out to be practically very, uh, very useful. Um, this would be the last function we discuss, which is also the most interesting. Uh, apologies for the expected with a capital E here, historical reasons. So we define the method swap, and believe me or not, the first four lines are the return type. And also, believe me or not, the return type is void. So it's a very fancy way of writing void there. And uh, I'm uh, writing it this way. Actually, I found a bug in the proposal because you can't actually swap any two uh, expected values. So swapping is enabled if and only if T would be a default uh, uh, no throw move constructible type, which means I can uh, move an R value of type T to another T without an exception. And uh, that is no throw whatever is an introspection primitive in the standard library. And something you may or may not, may not know, that particular primitive is not implementable in portable C++. You can't sit down and write it on your own. 
It's, uh, it's supported by a primitive inside the compiler, which is underscore, underscore, right? So in, it, you can't do it. It's an introspection thing that only the compiler knows about. It's not accessible to regular C++ code. Uh, I highly recommend you look into this stuff, you know, all of the, all of the, the underscore T things, all of the is this, is that, uh, because I believe introspection is really the business. So we have the is no throw move constructible, constructive, constructible. T must be like that. Um, T must be also swap of, swappable, but possible, possibly with a throw. And E must be also no throw move constructible and swappable. And let me explain why uh, this is and what happens here. So um, consider I want to swap this with RHS. So if I'm OK and the other guy is OK, easy. I just swap the A's, right? Everybody's fair, nice, right? Fine. Uh, that's an easy case. Uh, if I'm OK, but the other guy is not OK, I'm going to defer by swapping the order of arguments, so I'm going to uh, essentially punt on this case. It's going to be handled down. You see what I'm doing here on the S branch? If I'm OK and the other guy is not OK, uh, let the other guy handle it. So I, this is reuse, friends, right? <laughs> because otherwise, I have to copy the same code twice. All right, otherwise, so on this branch here, I'm not OK. I'm not OK. If I'm not OK and the other guy is also not OK, I'm swapping two inmates. It's good. Two bad people, right? Swap nay, RHS nay, we're good. And here's where the demons come, right? At the dot, dot, dot. So on the, the daisy cases are understood. We're good with the easy cases. These are sort of the obvious. OK, so now I have the hard case in which one is good and one is bad. So let's see how we swap a good person with a bad person and make it fly. Well, um, first we're going to create a T object by means of a move from nay. Remember, I'm bad, the other guy's good. So I'm going to create a temporary by moving from nay. So at this point, this is empty, is, uh, you know, can, can receive another object. But not before actually destroying the E that's there, you know, just for good form. This is almost unneeded for most types, but just to be like uh, in keep with uh, everything, uh, with the law, we're going to simply say, let, let me also call the destructor against the object that has been moved from. Notice that at this point, right here after the destructor, right here after this destructor call, at this point I committed to the transaction already because I moved from, from the guy. And if an exception happens below this point, that's bad. It means I lost irretrievably state. So we don't. That's why the requirement at the beginning, the signature. Remember, they must be no throw move constructible, etc. So um, we're gonna have. Okay, um, let me now create a new at the yay, which is now empty. I'm going to create um, a new by means of moving from RHS yay, because the other guy is good. Set the okay to true at this point. Okay equals true at this point. My object this is good has received the swap. And now I, go, I don't need to go the same about uh, RHS. RHS, yay, destroy the good guy, and then uh, move, the, move into it from T, and finally RHS, okay, gets true. Uh, false, because it was a bad. So this is difficult, and um, to wit, uh, it had uh, bugs in the, in the initial implementation, the proposal, and I find it very interesting to uh, think about and work on. Like, you know, when do you commit to transactions? What is the minimum amount of moves and risk you can take to make sure that this transaction goes through? I'm seeing ominous looks from the organizers here, so we're going to stop in a minute. Uh, typical use, you say expect a double runtime error, whatever, good equals 100, Ex a third star good is 100, expected, unexpected, you know the drill. Whenever you want to use it, there's a very nice helper function which is also called unexpected, which constructs an unexpected object. Guess what, right? So this would be a, a, a sort of... A, uh, simple, casual use of, uh, of expected. Great. So, 
With centralized use, you simply put star everywhere. Whenever you want to access anything, you're going to use star, and you're good. An exception is going to be thrown, and you're good. No problem. Uh, locally, you can always test uh, with if, as we discussed, and you're just fine. And uh, one other uh, topic of debate, this is the last topic we're going to discuss, is uh, if an expected of uh, uh, TE, sorry, uh, object is bad, but nobody looks at it, is it, should it throw or not? Should it signal the exception or not? So I was, I called a function, didn't succeed, but I never look at the value. Should anything happen? No. Amazingly, there was debate about this too. So I, I agree that the tree in the forest uh, philosophy, nothing, you know, if I don't care about that value, then nothing should happen. All right. With this, friends, we're done. Thank you very much. And don't forget your favorite color is green. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be around here if you have questions.